So, um, hi everybody. Um, I just said I'll, I'll kick it off now. We think we've got most people probably are here at the moment. So, you're very, very welcome to this Earth Institute event about the Fulbright Awards, the Irish Scholar and Student Awards. So, we had kind of realised that lots of our members have had won Fulbright Awards, as of many scholars and students across UCD, and there's been lots of interesting projects. Some of which you're, you're, you'll hear about when, and when the speakers um, tell you their stories. So we just thought it'd be a good idea to raise some awareness of the scheme and some of its and its benefits. Um, and if you've never been to any of the Earth Institute events before, you're very welcome. My name is Katrina Devery. I'm the research manager here at the Institute. Um, and we're UCD's Institute for Environmental Research. And if you're not a member and you'd like to be, um, just get in touch, uh, have a look at our website or email me. Um, so Fulbright Awards um, are grants for Irish citizens uh, or EU citizens resident in Ireland for three or more years to complete uh, postgraduate, postdoctoral, or professional researcher lecturing in the US for a period of up to one year. And there seems to be huge benefits to people in terms of networking and, and, and professional development, expertise, all kinds of things have come out of these schemes um, or have, have these awards. The deadline this year is the 2nd of November. Um, so we're very grateful to have Sonia McGuinness here, the Fulbright Awards Manager. She's going to speak about the schemes. Um, also, we have Fulbright UCD's Fulbright Alumni Ambassador, uh, Francesco Pila, who's at the School of in, in Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. And we'll also have contributions from three previous awardees, from Tom Curran, who's in the School of Biosystems and Food Engineering, Trasa de Lockery, who's in English uh, Drama and Film, and Patricia Kenny uh, in the School of Archaeology. And you hear a range of, of experiences from student to, students to staff, you know, they, they, they vary in, in, in what stage they are. So, um, we also have an opportunity after that for a Q&A after the talks. So if you have a question at any point during the talks, put it in the chat, I'll pick it up. Um, after or afterwards, just you can raise your hand if you want to ask it yourself. Um, and finally, we're re recording the session. So it's, it, this session has been recorded, just, so, just to let you know. So I'll hand you over first to Francesco. And then we have Sonia, Tom, uh, Trasa, and Patricia. And then there'll be the Q&A. So thank you. Hi, uh, so my name is Francesco. I'm, I'm based uh, in the outskirts of UCD, if you want to find me. Uh, so I'm the, um, UCD, uh, the UCD Fulbright ambassador. So what I'm doing as part of my, in my role, I, well, uh, I, I try to, to, to help uh, UCD applicants uh, to put together their, their application for their Fulbright award try to, 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 to share my own experience for, with my application, but also try to, to push them to, to put in more applications because uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the Fulbright Award uh, allows you to, to live a, a fantastic experience in, uh, in a, well, in an in a, um, institution in the United States where you, you wish to go. So I, I was, uh, um, I'm a previous, uh, I'm, uh, I got a, uh, Fulbright Tech Impact Award uh, back in 2015. Uh, I spent my, uh, well, fantastic four months uh, in uh, MIT. It was a life-changing experience. So whenever you read on the Fulbright website that uh, this is experience uh, will change your life, well, uh, believe it, because uh, at least that's what, what happened to me. Uh, I still remember, I, I, slept, I, mean, I have a lot of fond uh, memories of my time that I spent in the States because it was, I mean, a life-changing experience, not just from, uh, from a scientific and technical uh, level. So it was not just about going to work uh, in MIT for four months, but it was also about uh, um, experiencing a different uh, lifestyle, different, uh, different, uh, different costumes. A dif different uh, um, way to live, and so I, I, as I said, I really enjoyed my experience abroad. So I will, well, I would recommend it to all of you to put together to put together an application, and try to go and spend some time in the states. So as as regard the application, um, it is uh, uh, not too uh, demanding. So it's not a long application in terms of pages but it still requires a, 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 a certain amount of time to put together because it is, it is not easy, if I can say, to frame your ideas in, in a way that, uh, in a layperson way. So what I'm, I'm trying to say is uh, just don't write your proposal 
as you write a journal paper, uh, well, you, you need to make sure that it's understandable to a wider audience and just make sure that you, you bring your, mess, you, your message across. What is the impact that you want to, to achieve? Why do you want to go to the States? Why is it so, so important for you to go to the States? What, 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 what will be, what, why this experience will make the difference for you? But as I said, um, I'm happy to, to help you uh, to, to put together uh, your application. So please feel free to get in touch with, uh, with me, send me an email and I'll provide some more, uh, some more tips. So, well, I don't know, I, I just gave a very short uh, <laughs> introduction. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass it on to whoever is next uh, to Sony, I guess, uh, that could give more, more, more technical details about the application procedure and, and so on. Sonia, Sonia, are you here, Sonia? You can... Yeah, I'm back. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. I'm just having one of those days with tech. So can you see? I'm just going to... Can you see yeah. my screen there? That's all good. Okay, um, just to say... Um, slideshow? Is that working? Just to say my colleague, M. Paula Melvin, is also on the call, just in case I drop again. She can take over um, on my behalf. So um, hello to everybody. I am the program manager here at the Fulbright Commission in Dublin. And I'm just going to go briefly through um, the kind of application procedures for applying for a Fulbright Award and the different opportunities that we have available at the moment. Um, I would say that we have an application seminar, um, to, a webinar tomorrow, which uh, you should um, consider um, registering for, which is going to go actually through the application. Um, because it's quite a long application. It's going to be a really good webinar, so definitely register for it tomorrow. Okay, so just to give you um, a brief um, guideline to the timeline for applying for the Irish Fulbright Awards. So they opened on the 31st of August, um, and the closing date is the 2nd of November for applications. The applications are peer-reviewed between November and December um, 2020. Um, people who have been shortlisted for interview, the interviews will take place between January and February, and then the offers are made in uh, March 21. Okay. Um, for planning your application, it's important, first of all, to review all the information on our website, um, especially the frequently asked questions. Um, you need to choose an award type um, that you want to apply to. Um, you need to consider what course you'd like to go to in the US. Um, plan the proposal, put it together, and also make contact with potential hosts in the US, okay? Um, really important is to research what it means to be a Fulbrighter, and I suppose this is kind of unique in, those, in, those funding, um, in this funding environment, as in it's not just an academic um, funder, we're also, it's an academic and cultural award, therefore it's about giving back. You go as an ambassador for Ireland, you go to the US as a Fulbrighter, you learn, you come back to Ireland and you give back. So that's kind of really important. And it's also one of those things that a lot of candidates don't really express properly in their applications. So it's something that you really need to research um, before putting your application together. And if you're still interested in applying, you register through our website. And myself or uh, my colleague Paula will send you the um, instructions about how to fill out the application. Okay. So just to say, there are four categories of awards which would be of interest to um, postdoctoral students or, or academics, okay? We have the Irish Student Awards, which are for postgraduate researchers or degree programs in the US. We have the Irish Scholar Awards, which are for academic and professional research and lectures. And we have the Irish Tech Impact Awards, which are for academic and professional research with um, an information communications technology focus. And then we have the Fulbright Human Awards, which are, have a EU policy, EU US policy. And actually the Schumann Awards are um, the application process. You, you have to apply through the commission in Belgium. And the award, the awards actually opened on the 15th of September and they have a closing date of the 1st of December. So if you're interested in the Schumann Awards, you apply through the Belgium Fulbright Commission and you can look to their website for instructions on the application. So the Irish Student Awards are generally for four to 10 months. The Scholar Awards are between three and 10 months. Tech Impact can be anything between two to three months. And the Schumann Awards, again, are generally an academic year, okay? 
So we have a number, you can, there's a mechanism you can either apply to the all disciplines, which is across all academic fields, um, visual and performing arts, humanity, science, et cetera. We're inclusive of everything. Um, or we have a number of sponsored awards where we have funding available from um, um, our co-sponsors, um, so such as the um, EPA Award in Water Climate Change. So there's a pool of money dedicated to these sponsored awards um, and also we don't receive as many applications in these awards. So it's definitely worth looking into and researching to see whether your research matches any of these awards, um, these co-sponsored awards, and it will be definitely worthwhile applying. Um, there's also the NUI Scholar Award for early career NUI graduates. So that's something that you should look into, but across the board, as I suppose your institution there is, is kind of, it, it crosses all disciplines. So I'd say most of the co-sponsored awards we have available, um, would be you would you be relevant for so it's definitely worthwhile looking into these each of them has a flyer on our website so you can go into more detail on them um, with the co-sponsored awards with the sponsored awards you need to fill out an additional form um, it's a sponsored award form again if you have any um, queries on any of these um, sponsored awards please reach out to me okay um, just a basic finding a host in the US. I suppose this is kind of, it can be one of those difficult things and sometimes people don't know how to go about looking for um, hosts in the US. Um, so research experts in your field, um, talk to academics at UCD who have either attended conferences, who have done a body of research in the US themselves, will know experts in their fields. Um, you know, we welcome diversity across all academic institutions in the US. So, I mean, People generally think on the West and East Coast, there's over like 4,500 institutions in the US. Um, it could be a community college, which suits your area of research, or it could be an Ivy League school, but we welcome total diversity when it comes to academic institutions in, in the US, and we look for it. Um, definitely research, reach out to our Irish alum. Um, you can find their information on our websites. Um, I would say that UCD has a large proportion of um, Fulbright alumni um, and we get a large amount of applications from UCD. Probably the highest amount of applications come from UCD. Um, you can also reach out to our US alum. Again, information is on them and their kind of areas of discipline is available on our websites. Again, they might be in your area of discipline. They might, they can connect you with a colleague in the Hi, um, I'm Paula. I'm the other awards manager in the Fulbright Commission. I think Sonia has frozen on everyone, has she? Yeah, she's, she's frozen there, Paula. Hi. Okay. Hi, hopefully my internet won't go as well. Do you, um, have the, yeah. um, do you want to take over or do you want to try and share? Do you have your own screen to share or will you just... Um, yeah, we'll see if that works now. Um, but just for, about regarding finding a host, yeah. um, definitely talk to colleagues in your field. Um, so if you're in engineering, obviously talk to other people in engineering in UCD or whatever your field is, because um, they may have contacts you're unaware of in the United States or they have my, may have go, gone on different work trips to the United States. So they may not know someone. So the best, that's the best thing. Um, really what Fulbright is about is about an exchange between the United States and Ireland all of the United States and all of Ireland. So it's not simply supposed to be just between say UCD and Harvard or UCD and MIT. It is supposed to be about a diversity, a diversity in every way, which means obviously um, diversity of host institutions. So think outside the box, don't just apply for the ones you think of in kind of Massachusetts and in California. Also think of the North Dakotas and the Kansas. Sorry, Sonia, you're back. Do you want to continue? <laughs> you can finish Paula, because I just keep on thinking you're going to drop again. So you can just finish off there. Okay, um, Sonia, can I just get you to continue sharing your slides then? I just have oh, my yeah, own, no I haven't done screen share yet. Thank you. No problem, there. But yeah, definitely think outside the box in terms of what host institution you'd like to visit in the United States. Definitely talk to colleagues and um, it really is worth, um, it is really worth thinking outside the box and reaching out to different host institutions in terms of that. Sorry, Sonia, I just can't see the slides yet. Yeah, I think it's, I just have a problem because, hold on. Technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, big time. Oh yeah, so then simply um, definitely research what it means to be a Fulbrighter, the deadlines, as Sonia said, 2nd of November. 
uh, eligibility criteria on our website and definitely review all information on www.fulbright.ie. Uh, register your interest in the awards category. So register for the student or the scholar, the tech impact um, on our website. And then at that stage, like Sonia said, either myself or Sonia will send you the guidelines, the instructions. Definitely watch our videos on YouTube. We are doing a number of webinars. Obviously we weren't able to do our normal roadshow with COVID this year. So we have recorded different uh, other kind of virtual workshops we've done online so definitely review all those because there's definitely great tips from alum it is fantastic to touch base with myself and Sonia but it is also obviously fantastic to um listen to Fulbright experiences and how they actually did it themselves and get the tips from people who actually submitted successful applications themselves and as Sonia said at the start of this webinar definitely sign up for the Fulbright application process webinar on the 17th so um just on uh, just tomorrow because it'll literally be a webinar focused on how to apply and how to get through the application process so that's it from us for now thank you very much there that was a great great tag team efforts <laughs> <laughs> um that's perfect so we will we, we maybe if one of you or both of you are able to hang on for some questions but we'll move on to the contributions now from our from our you know previous awardees who have you know based in UCD so I'll, I'll ask Tom to go first thanks Katrina uh, my name is Tom Kern I'm a lecturer in the School of Biosystems and Food Engineering at UCD and I um, applied uh, for a Tech Impact scholarship in 2017 I, to be honest, uh, so I was going back to about this time, September 2016, um, I had uh, received an email, as people do, about um, uh, the annual call for Fulbright uh, applications, and I immediately deleted the email because I thought it wasn't relevant to me. And uh, I also kind of uh, didn't know much about Fulbright, to be honest, and um, I also you know, was wondering even was I qualified enough to apply. Um, but my, it was my um, head of school who convinced me to look into it further. So there was a, a webinar or um, a seminar, sorry, face to face that time in, in UCD. So I went along to that. And uh, I also looked at the, the website and I, um, you know, I had an idea in my head that this is uh, a scholarship probably for 12 months. and. With my personal circumstance, with my family uh, circumstance, I wouldn't be able to go for 12 months. And uh, I was thinking of all the reasons why I shouldn't apply. But uh, then when I looked into it more, I realized there was an opportunity for a shorter term research visit, um, the, the, the Tech Impact Scholarship. So that's between two weeks, uh, a minimum up to a maximum of three months, I think. And um, I applied to go for one month and I went to North Carolina State University and um, going back to the point that was made earlier, it's good to um, to kind of look at diversity of locations as well. They take that into account uh, in Fulbright applications as well in terms of locations uh, that you might apply for. So you don't necessarily all have to go to California or New York or Boston. Um, so it's really what uh, makes sense for you. And also um, in my research field, I cover quite a, a broad um, set of topics uh, between waste management and air quality. So I, I was thinking to myself, like, what would give me the best chance to um, be successful uh, in terms of a, a focused topic? And um, also, you know, what could show me to maybe to be a global leader in the field? So um, I had started some research a couple of years before that, um, uh, which I thought was very relevant. And it's the whole idea of uh, blockages in sewers hope everybody has got their lunch settled at this stage. But uh, these are um, more commonly referred to as fatbergs, as in an iceberg, but made of fat. So it's a combination of fat oil and grease. Uh, people put down their kitchen sink or from uh, commercial kitchens and restaurants, uh, combined with wet wipes and everything that people flush down their toilet. And these cause major blockages and sewers. It's a picture problem in the UK. So I was able to quote some uh, uh, kind of, uh, serious financial losses uh, that occur as a result of that. It costs uh, the UK water companies 100 million pounds sterling every year to deal with this problem. So I thought immediately I could say with my opening statement, this is a, a big problem and it's, it's a global problem that I could address. So 
I knew there was a researcher, a professor in um, North Carolina State University who was working in this area and he was a global expert. So I could immediately make a case that that's why I need to be based in the US on this important project. And uh, so I, I was successful anyway, and I went in um, the June, July of um, 2018. Um, like it, uh, there's a minimum of two weeks for the Fulbright Tech Impact, uh, but I didn't think that was credible to say I was only going for two weeks because I'd just be getting on, uh, on the plane and back again. Uh, but it, it was a quite short period of time. I would have preferred to have stayed for a bit longer, but uh, that's what suited me best uh, with my Fulbright host as well. So it's important to get a good project that you can say you can have an impact on and to, to have a host that you can justify why you need to be based in the US. Um, so because it was quite a short period, I had done some work and um, basically what I was looking at was developing technology um, that could detect a, a blockage occurring and predict where it was going to occur as so an advanced warning system. So I've done some tests in the, the UCD sewers uh, in advance. So I was able to bring that data with me and I wrote a, a paper with my Fulbright host. I also presented a paper at a conference in the US and uh, we have developed a couple of international funding applications since then as well. So that's the, the real tangible benefit I got out of it. And obviously there's the, the social aspect of it as well and cultural aspect, which is very important when it comes to Fulbright. So it's, there's no point in just doing an application and say, this is brilliant science or art or whatever it is. You have to bring in the Fulbright aspect that you're a cultural ambassador for Ireland, for UCD, etc. And you know, you have to also emphasize what can you bring back to Fulbright. So for example, we're giving these uh, presentations afterwards. I'm also a member of the Irish Fulbright Alumni Association board and I'm the uh, newsletter editor of that. And um, you know, just be aware of those things as well. So have a look at the Irish Fulbright Alumni um, dot com website as well. And, and you can read back at, at newsletters there and, and look at um, profiles of people. So it's not just the Fulbright Commission website, you should also look at the Fulbright Alumni Association website to get tips on, on and look at the experiences of former Fulbrighters. Um, also, I suppose um, my uh, career has, has uh, gone a bit strange since I had the Fulbright as well, in, in that, well, in a positive way, I think. <laughs> Um, I, uh, because of the, the type of uh, project I'm involved with, uh, th this particular research on fatbergs, um, there are not many researchers in the world that have uh, the fortune to be researching something smelly and uh, dirty like this. So uh, when there is a blockage, typically in London, I often get asked to do a media interview. So I've done several interviews with um, BBC, RT, etc. and all of that. And um, I also volunteered to do stand-up comedy on the topic. So um, there's a, a, a Bright Club Ireland, um, which is a comedy club for academics. And uh, they have uh, an event every couple of months. Uh, when it's before COVID, it would be in, the, in Whelan's of Wexford Street. So I performed in May 2019, uh, 13 minutes of comedy about uh, sewer blockages and uh, I, um, I I gave myself the name of Dr. Fatberg because like a superhero type guy um, because one of my friends calls, calls me Dr. Fatberg so that's my alter ego so I'm, that's, I'm also known as Dr. Fatberg and then after that so it's on YouTube if you care to uh, look at 30 minutes <laughs> of happiness <laughs> and me trying to make a fool of myself um, so if you look up Dr. Fatberg and uh, Taylor Swift is also in there because I did a parody of a Taylor Swift song at the end. So uh, I really went off the rails on this one. Um, and, and then afterwards, shortly afterwards, some people that I collaborate with on this type of research in industry, they decided to make a comic book about the, the issue. And uh, they asked me, could I be a character in the book? Now I, I had no input whatsoever in this, but I'm in this book called Attack of the Fatbergs. And uh, I'm not the orange guy there. I, that's, uh, that's Mr. Fatberg. 
uh, on this guy here. They gave me extra white hair. I had no input into this, I have to say. But anyway, that's I, I you can read all about it in my in my blog, which is the Fatberg and Fog blog. Um and it's on the UCD website if you have a look at that, Google for it. Um so I would say um you know there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, you know, try and if you're applying uh, focus on something that you're really good at. Leadership is also important, uh, whether you're a leader in your research field or, um, you know, whether you've been a leader of a club or society in UCD or whatever like that. That, that is a very important thing to emphasize when you're uh, making the application. So um, I'm happy to, um, you know, follow up with any questions that you might have at the end of this. I'm only available at three o'clock today. But uh, feel free to email me afterwards, tom.kern at uc.ie, or have a look at the website uh, for more information. So thanks very much, and best of luck with your applications if you decide to apply. Thank you, Tom. That's great. Dr. Fatberg, and uh, <laughs> we'll hand over now to Trasa, Trasa de Lockery from the School of English Drama and Film. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. Tom's a tough act to follow. I don't have any comic books or comedy sketches, sadly. Um, but I won the Fulbright NUI um, PhD Student Award which um, in 2014, which doesn't seem to quite exist anymore. It's um, a scholar award, but it was a co-fund basically between Fulbright and NUI. Um, and I went to UCLA for six months then in 2015, and it was near the end of my PhD. So I went over for six months, but I came back um, at the start of June and I went into a PhD um, hibernation cave where all I did was write and produced a PhD at the end of that year. So I guess my main reasons for going to UCLA, you know, unlike some of the other awards which are geared more towards um, academics or people who are more established in their field, you know, I was just an early career stage researcher finishing my PhD. So my justification for going was very methodological and it was very much about training. So I'm in the School of English Drama and Film. I'm an assistant lecturer there now, so I've come full circle. I did a few years in the UK. Um, and when I went to UCLA, what I was saying was that there wasn't, um, so I was looking for more kind of contact with scholars who had expertise in post-colonial eco-criticism. So it's a field of kind of literary cultural studies um, and in a broader array of world literatures. So my department at UCD at the time, there was only like one person who did that. Um, and then I was going to attend graduate seminars. So they have lots of graduate seminars um, in the States. So they don't tend to have MA programs, which is like the normal route in you know, um, Northern Europe for humanities scholars. You do your, your undergrad, you do your MA, you do your PhD. In the States, you go undergrad to PhD and you take these really advanced graduate seminars. So I took a few of those um, that were related to my field. They're also running a really prestigious environmental humanities seminar series at the time as well. And like some of the leading scholars in the field were involved um, in organizing it, were based at UCLA. So I had like lots of good reasons to go that this would expose me to great networks of people. It'll be great methodological training. Um, I would just be getting great experience in terms of seeing where the field was going as well, seeing all the emergence kind of new directions. Um, so those were like some of my major reasons. And obviously when I was there, I gave some talks as well, seminar series that were on in the department. And I went around the States as well and gave talks. Um, so they're very academic reasons for going, but they weren't the only reasons I put my application. And I guess my big tip for Fulbright is that they're not looking for people who just want to go to the US and hang out with Professor X, who's the biggest name in their field, and to come up with like some innovative um, results or kind of technique. They want to see that you've thought about, like the idea of a few people have mentioned that you're a cultural ambassador, that you're going to make connections with people and networks. Um, and that, like Tom said, when you come back, that you'll feed back into the community in other kind of ways. So my other reason for going to California was because it's the birth of the global environmental activist movement and arguably um, to some regard environmental science too, which emerged out of um, the huge uh, Santa Barbara oil spill in the 1960s, which led to the Get Out Oil campaign, which led to Earth Day, which led to different kinds of environmental activist movements that popped up all around kind of California and the rest of the US. So that state has a very healthy environmental activist tradition and civic environmental tradition as well, um, which was great. And it was great to tap into that. And it also had a really healthy Fulbright community. So the home for 
and the Fulbright kind of social activities in California was um, at Los Angeles and Anne Kerr was running it at the time. And she would run these great Fulbright events where she'd get all the different scholars together from all different parts of the world. And I went to like a Lakers like NBA game, which was complete. The significance of that was lost on me. So I came home and people told me. Um, her son is Steve Kerr, who's like a really famous basketball player who I met. And again, significance was lost on me. Um, but she also brought us to like, you know, to see like the LA River. And we did this like civic environmental outreach program and like Fulbright bring everyone together for kind of different activities. So like it was really super from that point of view. Um, I guess then the things that helped me to do at that stage in my career helped me to consolidate my methodology. I gained a lot more confidence um, in terms of my work and where it was going. I could kind of see where the field was going. I established all these great networks. Um, and I think that kind of stood to me too as a humanities scholar because there's not a huge amount of funding that we can apply for as early career um, researchers. So when I went on to apply for jobs and postdocs, it was a really significant thing to have in my CV. And I think it helped me. I kind of, I got, you know, I kind of skipped the postdoc wrong. I was able to go get into jobs pretty quickly. So, um, you know, I don't know for sure, but I think definitely the experience of applying for the Fulbright and going kind of helped me in terms of how I presented myself later on at job interviews. Um, and just because I had that kind of increased confidence in my own work too. So I guess just a couple of tips. Look at other applications um, for sure. Be really feasible about what it is that you can achieve. You can achieve everything. So if it is a very constrained methodological reason that you're going like that's fine um, think about your budget be very careful about budgeting um, Fulbright the money they gave me was enough for me to live in Los Angeles but not like it, there wasn't really much else I could do with it like rent in LA is crazy expensive and I, I had a room in a shared house and it was like nearly a thousand dollars a month so if you want to go start saving now um, and think about what your department here can maybe help you do in terms of fees and stuff. So just be really strategic about that. Um, again, think beyond the scholarly. So think about like the cultural reasons you might have for wanting to go to the US. Are you interested in Irish language or uh, connecting with the Irish diaspora community? Or do you have an interest in, like I have an interest in yoga, another good reason for going to California. Like are there things that kind of draw you to the place that you're going to? Um, keep in touch with Fulbright as well if you have any issues. Um, at UCLA, they, they were trying to charge me extra fees for, um, they called it institutional technology fee, and we had to kind of rebut that. Um, and full, I just went back to Fulbright straight away in Ireland, and they helped me kind of work things out. So if any kind of problems come up, I always go back to Fulbright straight away. And find a host early on. Um, really, it's hard to get through to interview if you, if you don't have that invitation letter. Um, and academics are really busy and stressed and you need to develop a relationship with them and they need to understand your reasons for coming and the reason um, that you want them to mentor you. Um, so I got in touch with my host in maybe July or August, like fairly early on, and we developed a relationship by email and I, I, I wanted her to be fairly hands-off. She was and that was great in the end, um, but we had a fairly intense relationship up to the point where I got the, the invitation letter. So do you plan this really early on? So. Thanks, Trina. That's great. Thank, thank you very much, Tressa. And now, Patricia, we'll hand over to you. Hey. Um, so, yeah, I, I, my name is Patricia. I'm a final year PhD student in the School of Archaeology, and I'm a 2019-20 uh, awardee. Uh, so I went over to the States on the Creative Ireland Museum Fellowship. I went to the Smithsonian. Um, and I left in February 2020, the first week of February 2020, and then I was supposed to stay there for four months, but, you know, the pandemic happened, and I came back in March 2020, um, a bit ahead of schedule. Um, but what I was doing there, um, so I was looking at fossils found on prehistoric archaeological sites in America, and I was comparing that to this, um, there's a huge body of work, um, on fossil lore from Native American tribes from the colonial era up to the modern day. And there's a really diverse um, amount of beliefs and practices to do with fossils and other geological, um, geological features such as that. And so I wanted to see if I could trace some of those practices back through time and see what kind of impact they leave on the archeological material culture. Um, and I mean, I suppose, I'm really interested in the history of geology, like how people started 
how we came up with the discipline essentially and how different societies across the world have come up with that discipline so it was an amazing opportunity for me to be able to go there and um, see kind of study how how that history can be reflected in a non or or a non written society so in Europe, we kind of know how, like we, we wrote down, we were writing by that stage, uh, whereas the Native Americans have an oral tradition. And so it's, it's a lot more difficult to see how, um, how practices are, are reflected onto the material culture. But um, I was spending a lot of my time in a big warehouse out in Suitland in Maryland. Um, so it was, <laughs> It was absolutely amazing. It was full of artifacts and biological specimens. And I mean, there was an entire floor which was just mammoth skulls. If you can, like, it was kind of creepy, but it was also quite cool. Um, and I, yeah, I, I was working away. I found, I had found some evidence that some of the practices extended back a little bit into time. Um, and then five weeks after I arrived, the Smithsonian shut down and mm -hmm. we were all put on work from home orders. And then a week after that, the Irish government recommended that anybody who was not a permanent resident of the United States should come home to Ireland. Um, so I think my Fulbright experience was a little bit different from maybe other, well, I mean, our entire cohort had probably a similar experience, but from previous years. Um, and despite that, I mean, I really think the Fulbright deciding to go for the Fulbright was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, it was an absolutely amazing experience. The six weeks that I was there, I met some fantastic people. I got to work on a project that is really close to my heart. And um, I definitely think that there's scope there for future collaborations. I was chatting to some people whom I was working with, and I think definitely it's something that I will be returning to in the future. Um, and I mean, just to echo what people were saying about having a good reason for going there. I mean, um, there are some people who are studying kind of fossils and other geological, um, I don't really know what the word is, but other geological features and trying to see how people interact with them. And a lot of them are in America. So there was a folklorist in Stanford who, um, she wrote the book on, Fossil Legends of the Native Americans. I mean, it's a fantastic book and it's what sparked my interest in this. Um, and she's in Stanford and she, when I contacted her saying, oh, I'm thinking of doing a Fulbright, she said, go to the Smithsonian. Uh, that's where you should be um, to look at the archeological side of this. Uh, and then there's also this, um, most of the work that has been done on this is done in court, sort of the American Northeast. And also the folklore side is obviously from the South west um, so i really thought that the smithsonian was the right place for me to be because uh yeah the the few people who had done work on this had done it in that area um i think like in terms of impact i mean i'm in the last year of my phd and that's kind of my focus for now but i think the fulbright has definitely had a really um it's been an eye-opening experience. It's opened my mind to career paths that I had not considered before. I mean, working in a really public-facing institute like the Smithsonian has, I mean, it was entirely different. And the work ethic over there is entirely different. And the work-life balance is, uh, <laughs> takes a bit of getting used to, but it was, um, I think I have a lot clearer, I have more ideas about what I want to do now once I finish in hopefully 12 months. Um, so, yeah, I would say so far the Fulbright has had quite uh, an important impact in terms of my career progression and where I see myself going in the future. Um, and I was just thinking, I mean, I went to one of these seminars two years ago uh, in 2018 and I kind of I had this really vague idea. I had read this book and I was interested in doing this sort of thing. Um, but I wasn't sure about the Fulbright. I thought maybe it wasn't for me, that this wasn't the sort of project they were interested in. Um, and I, I mean, I went to the seminar and I decided to just try it. And, you know, what's the worst that can happen? And I would recommend anybody who's here who is on the fence, who is not sure whether or not they should do it, 
just go for it. It could be one of the best experiences of your life. I mean, even the application process really helped me to crystallize some ideas that I had floating around in my head. Um, so from start to, from the beginning of the application all the way through to my visit to the States, it was probably one of the best experiences of my life so far. Um, in terms of other advice, I mean, when you're building your application, don't be afraid to contact the Fulbright office and obviously other Fulbrighters for help. Um, so for example, particularly if you need a letter of affiliation, which I did to go in with the application, um, it took me two months to get from when I sent that email, first email to get that letter of affiliation. And there was a period of time when nobody was responding to me and I thought this is never gonna happen. But I uh, emailed Paula and she worked her Fulbright magic and suddenly I had a response in my inbox. So don't be afraid to reach out for help if you're just not getting anywhere with that. Um, and finally, I mean, yeah, so I would be more than happy to help people with their application. I had, uh, I spoke to probably three or four people while I was doing my, full, like previous Fulbrighters while I was doing my application and it is enormously helpful, uh, definitely do reach out uh, and ask questions look in your department or in the broader in the earth institute or the broader university environment um yeah so that's that's all i have to say thank you very um, much patricia yeah. that was that was great really interesting it's, it's, it's such a shame that you uh, didn't get the full experience but it sounds like you got a lot out of it anyway so i did yeah i definitely did good um, so now I've just got some time for some questions. I have a few questions already. Um, the ones that I have so far seem to be, well, some of them seem to be kind of more for the Fulbright um, people. If Sonia's, is Sonia's still there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. It's moved. Um, so uh, one question is, um, how important is the academic standing or say the profile of the host academic and, and their reference and, or how does that kind of reference or vouching process work? You mean the host academic? Yeah, the host. No. No, it's just, well, like obviously they have to be an institution or a government institution in the US, but it's more to do with the, per the, the person applying, the applicant and their area of research. And obviously sometimes, you know, the host, you might be working alongside with them as opposed to being supervised by them. So it's really as long as it's coming from uh, like uh, an affiliated institution, a recognized American institution or a government funded institution in the US. There isn't a problem so it's not yeah it's funny i've never been asked that question before so it's a new one for me but so no. it's more really it's about the project itself and the kind of connective it's about the project and the person, person. Applying. Yeah. yeah it's not about an amazing uh, host you know okay you, you you might be going to an amazing host in your area of research but it's, it's more about what you're planning to do and how you're planning to do it and about you as as the applicant as, as opposed to the host Okay, that's great. All right, um, could I just add briefly yeah. to that as well? Um, I'm sure like other Fulbrighters here on this call, um, I've been um, reviewing uh, some applications over the last couple of years as well. Um, so one of the things that uh, was a benefit to me, or I think that would be useful, um, that when you are getting the, the host letter, um, if you can just, if the host can kind of, uh, write in such a way that it, it's more obvious how the, the visitor will fit into their research mm. team. I think that would be useful. I got a really good letter myself when I was going much better than I expected. Uh, the, the host went to an awful lot of trouble to explain how my research would fit in with theirs. So that's just a tip I would give uh, because I was just expecting a letter from saying, yes, we'll give you a desk and access to the internet. <laughs> So, I, if you, yeah, I suppose there is this misconception as well that people need the letter of affiliation at mm. time of applying, and actually they don't. You know, so some people might have might say in their application, "I've reached out to these two potential hosts. I'm waiting for confirmation of a letter of affiliation, etc." And sometimes you just don't get it in time, and and that's we, we take that into consideration. So, but as long as you're clear about your plan and these are the places you. Are hoping to go and also we'd have students who might be applying to do master's program in the programs in the us and their choices don't work out and they have to apply to an additional institution but it doesn't as long as they get into that additional institution we'll still you know they're still a fulbrighter you know we wouldn't hold it back you know they'll be successful sometimes through fulbright before they get an offer from a host institution in the us is what i'm saying so sometimes it can come hand in hand mm -hmm. that makes sense 
Great, thank you. Um, next, second question is, would it be okay to go somewhere to work on a book that you already have a contract for? Is that, would that be, what, how would that fit within the norms of? Yeah, well, first, yeah, it's, there's kind of a commercial piece to that. And she just, they, if they email me directly, it's whether they're going to do, the justification for going to the US is important. What, is it's it a, kind of a research base? Is or it a piece of research for, or is it just they want time out? You know, so mm. it, it depends on what they're doing and the justification for going to the US would be very important. Um, and then that kind of commercial aspect, I'd need to double check it, you okay. know? Um, we can get that person to, to drop you yeah, an email, email directly. directly. Yeah. Uh, I have another question then again about someone who had uh, a GSI Fulbright Geoarchaeology Award in 2016-17 and would now like to apply for a general Fulbright to do a totally unrelated project on community museums in the Philippines but with the same institution as before. Um, would they need to explain that in the, in the application why the new project is totally different or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If it's Would it matter path, that they had a previous one? It, it, there's, there has to be a certain amount of time between the two. So as far as I recall, I'd need to double check the time. I think it's for maybe four or five years. So that might be a problem. But um, if there's justification for going back to the US and, and the time is, is fine with regards to the previous Fulbright, um, she, they would need to explain that in, in their application. If they want to email me directly. Um, I put your email address into the chat there. Yeah. So. Um, and it's Thank online. You, and I can follow up. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I suppose the one thing I would say is that if you've received a Fulbright, you know, within the last few years, preference would always be given to people who haven't. I would say yeah. that, you know. Yeah, that would, um, yeah, yeah. That's probably standard enough. And then the last question I have here if anyone else has any questions, just put them in the chat or maybe Will, could you keep an eye if anyone's raising their hands? And just while I read this out. Um, so when you're making the case, um, I suppose, is it enough, someone's asking, is it enough to say that your research will benefit from the, the mentorship of this particularly well-known person or, or someone very well positioned for your research, or is it, would it be better to have it more uh, specific or kind of about the location? Um, there are, they, they, they need to go and research with this particular academic. Yeah, would it be, I suppose in a lot of, I suppose in a lot of applications, you might say, I want to do this, project be because this, this academic person. is amazing yeah. and i need to go to him and they're based in a yeah. lab in the us and that's where i need to be that's yeah. fine that's that's, that's enough fine. Yeah, yeah absolutely okay. that sounds good uh, obviously back. proving why they're an amazing academic and then you go visit them. no you know what i mean yeah that's absolutely fine okay so one more question from stefan um do you want to unmute yourself and ask ask the question stefan yep um i just have two questions so uh I think, Sonia, you mentioned that it's a cultural ambassador. I'm originally actually from Germany, so uh, would it be worthwhile to stress a more diverse cultural, maybe uh, not just Ireland, yes, so I'm not sure how to pitch it. And then second, uh, I would prefer a research-only project, but then it's this combination of research or lecture series, so what is the advice here to... Uh, what to do? Yeah, the majority of academics would go on research. They would be doing research. Like they might give a seminar or two in the US, but it's generally research based. Um, the, uh, the candidates from Ireland going over to the US. And in reference to the, the fact that you're originally from Germany and you're living in Ireland, I suppose um, it's, uh, it, it's funny because there's a two year home rule and built in Fulbright, which is if you take a, a take a Fulbright you're expected after your some students might stay and finish their PhD in the US but the expectation is that you come back to your home country um, after you finish your Fulbright with the Provido this is only if you ever in the future would like to go and work and live in the US at like full time as in apply for citizenship in the US so I presume the expectation is you come back to Ireland, but Stefan, I suppose also there is diversity in the program and we're inclusive of anyone who's living in Ireland, who's, a, who's you know, a member of the EU, can apply through our commission. So yeah, diversity is always seen as good and you'll see it in our, our kind of mission statement at the, at the top of the instructions this year as well. We've added that in. So yeah, I, I built it into your application, um, especially you living in Ireland is already 
diversity, you know what I mean? And then that kind of Irish German experience going to the US and bringing it back, it's all good, you know, it's all positive. That help? Ooh, okay, thank you. And then I have a question from Roisin. How many fellowships are usually awarded every year? Um, I think I have 18 scholars going out this year. I don't know, Paula, how many students do you have going out? I'd say it's roughly 37. I think I have 18 yeah. students and this year we only have five FOTAs. Some people dropped out due to coronavirus, but hopefully that will impact you all for 21, 22. Hopefully not. So any more questions? Caroline is asking, if your application is successful, is there a defined period of time that you need to travel like within, the, within six months? Is it generally within the next year of? Yeah, no, it's within the academic year. So you have to go between August and August 21 and be back June, July, you know. Yeah, 20, yeah it's the academic year. Yeah, that's um, and we don't allow for deferrals. So it, it, it's generally if you're successful, you're, the expectation is that you leave by September. Now, some people might go on a three month grant and they might leave until January 22. So, but the time period is August to um, like June, July, the following okay. year. Unless, okay, so unless there's any more questions from anybody, I, I might wrap it up. Um, just to say thanks very much to everybody. Um, oh, one more question, just a question for Tom here. Um, I know a couple of people said to me they have to leave. So if, you're, if you have to leave, no problem. No problem. Bye. Um, question for Tom, did you have to seek head of school approval to go away during academic year? Well, yeah, my, my head of school was the one who actually told me <laughs> to apply for it, yes. So I did uh, organise that. So because I'm lecturing, um, it suited me to go away in the June, July period uh, when there would be no lectures on at that time. So he was fully supportive. Okay. I just add one more thing, and especially what Patricia said, and even Tom, it's that whole idea, oh, I don't think I'm going to fit into this, or I'm not suited to this, or my academic fact. Like, take a leap of faith, you know, look and see what we have on our website. I mean, it's funny when you read the personal statements of the people coming through when they apply, and you, you see that a lot, oh, I didn't think it was right for me, or, you know, and, but it's, there's so much available to you and, and you know, diversity, etc. So just take a leap of faith and look at our, the awards on offer, look at the sponsored awards on offer, and I'm sure there'll be something to suit you and apply. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, and everybody who, who contributed there. And if there's anything we can help with in the Earth Institute, just, just get in touch. Um, I'm happy to maybe have a look at an application or have a chat at least. Um, and, and likewise, you've got everybody's email address there in the chat uh, so everybody seems to be happy enough to take questions by email afterwards.